Hello, and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at how a primary school teacher from India managed to get away with murder for over four years, and subsequently becoming known as one of the country's most prolific serial killers. Mohan Kumar was born on the 6th of April 1963. He was raised with his sister and two brothers in Mangalore, Karnataka, which is a state in southern India. His parents worked as labourers for wealthy farm owners and were paid a basic daily wage. Money was scarce and as part of a governmental housing redevelopment scheme in the 1970s, the family moved to a single-storey house where the children spent their childhood. Despite limited educational opportunity, the four siblings were bright and worked hard at school. Mohan was known to be particularly keen on sports, particularly cricket and the contact team sport, Kabaddi. In the mid-1970s, Mohan's father abandoned his family, leaving Mohan's mother to raise the four children alone. After finishing his high school education, Mohan attended Apinagadi First Grade College in Dakshina, Canada to obtain his degree. After graduation, he became a primary school teacher, working on a contractual basis at various schools across the district. He would teach physical education and sports to the young children. His first marriage ended in divorce and his family then arranged for him to marry a woman by the name of Mandula with whom he had two sons. Whilst he was always pleasant to Mandula, Mohan was very distant within the marriage and they would do very little together as either a couple or as a family. Unknown to Mandula, Mohan had married another woman during this time and had two more children. Mandula believed that during the lengthy periods which Mohan spent away from her, Mohan was working hard to support their family, and presumably his third wife, who was unaware of Mandula, felt the same. The truth, however, was far more sinister. Mohan had lost his latest teaching job in 2003 and could not find a new position. Unable to support his two families, he became desperate for money. With no employment prospects, he devised a devastating simple plan. Missing persons in some of the poorer communities in the area were often never fully investigated or solved. Many were simply overlooked, a fact that Mohan was aware of and determined to exploit. His plan required that he target his victims very carefully. Mohan would loiter in public places, particularly bus stations, where he would look for women that he could befriend. Using a fake name, he would introduce himself as a government official in order to strike up a conversation and find out more about the women he was talking to. He would engineer that conversation to seek out the women who were unmarried. Generally, these women would be in their late 20s or early 30s, an age where, for many, they would be desperate to find a husband. He would ensure that these women were from communities which were both socially and financially disempowered. Often, these women were from families of daily wage earners, where being unmarried at what was considered to be an advanced age was seen as both costly and undesirable. If the woman fitted within his criteria, Mohan would charm them with promises of a job, relationship and a better life. After a whirlwind romance, he would propose marriage, declining to take a dowry, a custom which, whilst illegal, was still very common in low-income areas. He would then suggest to his bride-to-be that they should not wait any longer to be together and that they should elope. Once the woman had agreed his proposal and suggestion of elopement, an offer of marriage from a charming professional government official being difficult to turn down, Mohan would tell them that he had planned their wedding in a different city. He would encourage the unsuspecting woman to bring their finest clothes and jewellery. This was often their only possessions of any value, and he encouraged them to bring them along for their wedding celebration. They would board a bus and make their way to another city. Upon arrival, Mohan would book a hotel room for the night near to the bus station, using fake names in the hotel register. 
That night, Mohan would have sex with a woman, although it is unclear from news reports whether this was consensual. The following morning, he would tell them to leave their jewellery in the hotel room for safekeeping so that they could head to the temple. As the couple made their way past the bus station, Mohan would tell the woman that she needed to take a contraceptive pill so that she would not become pregnant. Handing her the tablet, Mohan would advise that she would feel the need to urinate straight after it was consumed. As such, the woman would go into the ladies' toilet at the bus station to take the pill. Unknown to the woman, the item that Mohan had given her was not actually a contraceptive, but a cyanide pill. Almost immediately, the unsuspecting woman would collapse and die. Mohan would then return to the hotel, take the jewellery and take the next bus out of town. This was often before his victim had even been found. When the woman was found, the police would often struggle to identify her. Pictures of the victims tended to be circulated locally where no one would have known her. These deaths would often be recorded as drugs related or suicides of unidentified women. Mohan was killing vulnerable women and it would appear that no one even realised that they were dealing with a serial killer. After each murder, he would pawn the jewellery of his victims and use the money to take care of his two separate families. With each kill, he became bolder and more arrogant. In some cases, it is understood that he telephoned the woman's family a few days after their murder and informed them that they had eloped and were very happy so the family should not worry about their daughter. It appeared that his plan was almost foolproof until a woman by the name of Anitha went missing on 16th of June 2009. Anitha was just 22, younger than many of Mohan's other victims. Anitha's family and friends searched for her for days without any success. They were convinced that their daughter had not run away from home and the family and local community pressured the police into action. The police began by looking at Anitha's phone records and it was here that Mohan's perfectly laid plan began to unravel. One of the numbers on Anitha's phone belonged to another lady, Carvery, who had been missing since March 2009. In turn, when Carvery's phone records were examined, two more numbers were linked to missing women. The police soon realised that someone was making calls from one missing woman's SIM card to the next. Unknown to the investigating police at the time, Anitha's unidentified body had been found the day after her disappearance at a bus station around 100 miles from where she lived. After further investigation, the police eventually found a common link, Mohan Kumar. On the 21st of October 2009, 46-year-old Mohan was brought in for questioning. He admitted killing Anitha and at least 19 other women. Some reports state that he confessed to killing as many as 32 young women. These murders dated back to 2004. He provided the police with the details of how he had committed these murders, although he was unable to recollect the names of many of his victims. Those who knew Mohan were in shock. They had no idea that he was anything other than a well-liked, upstanding citizen. The case was brought to the Mangalore Fast Track Court in November 2011, before moving to the 4th Additional and District Sessions Court. The investigating teams gathered enough evidence and witnesses to put Mohan on trial for 20 murders. By this point, Mohan claimed he was innocent. He defended himself, presenting thorough arguments and scouring law books to find loopholes which he could attempt to exploit. Despite these attempts, he was convicted of several of the murders and received the death penalty for his crimes. He remains in prison to this day determined to appeal his sentence. Normally, in a case like this, I would like to provide the names of all the victims, as they are the most important part of the story. I apologise for not doing so in this case, but reports vary greatly, so I've decided not to include the names, rather than potentially include them incorrectly. Thinking of all the victims at this time. That concludes today's story. It's the first time I've covered a story from India. Let me know what you thought of it in the comment section. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel.
Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. The ancient Indian sport of kabaddi is believed to have been played as far back as 4,000 years ago. Goodbye.